live. Um, and I kindly want to present you Iftikhar Ahmad, who's the leader of the team uh, and also the brains behind the Labor Rights Index. Uh, Iftikhar, can you tell us a bit about, um, well, uh, how the Labor Rights Index came to life, um, who your team is uh, and what you did in the past couple of months? You have the floor. Thank you, Fiona, for your kind words. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Iftikhar Ahmed. I'm the Liberal Law Specialist with the Wage Indicator Foundation and the founder of Center for Liberal Research. Besides this work uh, with the government of Pakistan on labor law reforms, the center is the Global Labor Law Office of the Wage Indicator Foundation. It is uh, truly a humbling experience for me to present before you the second edition of the Liberal Rights Index. Uh, we humans uh, do have plans and dreams, but uh, we don't always find the right support to convert those dreams into reality. For that support, I would like to immensely thank the Wage Indicator Foundation, especially my boss for uh, a long time, 10 years, Pauline Osse, for her encouragement over more than a decade and the opportunity to work on the comparative labor issues now, the Labor Rights Index. I'm also grateful to my team here at the Center for Labor Research, uh, the teams that were uh, the team that was part of the Labor Rights Index 2020 and now the new team that is part of the Labor Rights Index 2022 in creating the Labor Rights Index and uh, those who had to work really long hours to have this, uh, uh, to, uh, to have all this work done. I'm also thankful to my family, my wife and my kids uh, who have sacrificed uh, vacations and weekends uh, for, nearly, uh, for nearly a whole year uh, to help us work nonstop. I hope to compensate for that in the near future. So why work on the Labor Rights Index? What's the reason behind? Well, there are three reasons. Two are more work-related and one is more related to myself. First, if you look for the word index online, you will find thousands of options on Google. So there are hundreds of indices online, but we don't find a single de jure Labor Rights Index which compares labor legislation for as many indicators, for example, uh, that we have, for example, we have 10 indicators and we are covering 135 countries. Uh, if you look at uh, the labor force of the world, we are, we are looking at the labor legislation which regulates 90%, nearly 90% of the labor force in the whole world. So there have been academic exercises before and the work by the UN level, but they were either focused on a couple of indicators for example, there has been work on trade union rights, but uh, uh, either the work was limited to a single indicator or two indicators, or they were done only once. So they were not, uh, they were done once, but uh, they were never revised. Secondly, wage indicator has been working on the decent work checks since 2008. Uh, through decent work checks, we informed the workers about their real workplace rights. So this was a logical step uh, to us to work on the Labor Rights Index. The third reason that I have is more about myself. We were raised by a single mother. She was not schooled for long. She did not complete high school. But uh, what she taught us through her life uh, was to stand up for the rights of others. And in a globalized world, I, uh, I don't see any other way to stand up for the rights of others and to inform people of their rights and then uh, once they know about their rights, they, they can also stand up for themselves and for, their, uh, for the people that, that they know. Uh, so th these are actually the three reasons that have compelled me and our organizations to work on the Labor Rights Index. Uh, one thing that we need to clearly mention, a Labor Rights Index is a de jure index, which measures only the presence or absence of labor legislation. It looks at, at the every aspect of the working lifespan of a worker. We don't make an implementation and there are reasons for that. Uh, it would be very difficult uh, to, uh, um, to make uh, the implementation of labor legislation for 10 indicators and for 135 countries in a cost-effective way. No other organization in the world has done it so far. So it is, a, it is really impossible to, uh, to cover uh, to look at uh, the situation, how the laws are being implemented. And one reason to look for uh, law is also because uh, the inclusive labor legislation is the first step towards uh, having decent work. 
Now, uh, the second question could be, who needs the labor rights index? But, uh, our index is mainly aimed at the governments, at the union level organizations, at the trade union movement, uh, as well as uh, the index can be used by the civil society organizations uh, who can ask the government to do reforms. Uh, similarly, the index could be used by individual workers who are thinking of uh, doing work in some other country. Similarly, the index could also be used by the businesses to, uh, to start doing somewhere. So, at the same time, the index could also be used by the donors to, uh, to ask the countries to do the reforms. Because the first step towards improvement in the real lives of uh, a labor force is that uh, the labor laws are reformed first. And then uh, the next step could be that uh, whether they are being um, complied with or not. So the, the third thing that we would like to talk about is uh, what is new in the Labor Act Index 2022. As has been explained in the short video, uh, the first index launched in 2020 had 115 countries. It, uh, with addition of 20 more countries, and now uh, we are covering 135 countries. It now includes more contextual uh, data to help you understand the scores of a country. We are including the complete legal basis for each country. Uh, so um, Every user can look at our score and rating and they can understand why we have scored a country in a specific way. For example, if, if, we, if we have a given a score, uh, if we have given a higher score, you can, you can look at the law yourself and then you would find that uh, the scores are right. Uh, the, the index and the country files, they also show the COVID-19 and labor market information concerning the sick leave. Uh, the, the index also indicates, uh, and now in the report, in the whole report, if you look at the report, the index also has regional maps. With this, uh, I would like to hand over to our team member, Hina Tariq. Uh, she will go through the key findings of the report. Okay, Hina. thank you very much. Thank you. So we actually see key global trends in five of those main section that we were looking at for minimum wage, we already know that 90% of 135 countries are paying minimum wage. However, one of the things that came across was the fact that MENA was MENA region was one of the only regions that had seven out of 10 countries that weren't paying minimum wage. However, this year, Qatar did pass new labor legislation. It's the first country in the MENA region to set a minimum wage, irrespective of nationality or grade or gender, which is a great first step. When it comes to paternity leave, paternity leave is still a very recent um, concept, but we have seen great improvements across any country that has uh, pushed out any new labor legislation, now has at least seven days for fathers to take at the birth of their child. When it comes to equal paper work of equal value, we see that Bahrain, Bolivia, Montenegro, Togo, and um, and Vietnam did now introduce equal paperwork of equal value in their new labor legislation. We sadly find that pregnancy testing or inquiring about pregnancy during the recruitment is still a huge issue globally, with 62% of countries still allowing that out of the 135 countries. So there is definite room for improvement there. Uh, finally, we'll end on a good note where women's access to same job as men has definitely improved and we say that women are now more part of the workforce with fewer restrictions and that is definitely improving. However, um, South Asia and men are still have a lot of room for improvement where we can definitely push for new legislation to increase women participation in all types of jobs. We then move on to the average scores that we have had over all 10 indicators. The performance has been quite varied. We have some indicators that have done much better than the others, such as the child and forced labor with 91%, which is a great sign, which means that priorities around the world have changed and now really do value children education over employment. We see safe work doing very well, and on the other hand, on the flip side, we do see some uh, sectors, some indicators really in need of a lot of work. Trade unions are the weakest link with only 50.5% of the countries respecting uh, labor's rights to association, labor's right to collective bargaining and labor's right to strike. 
when it comes to family responsibilities that would allow better work-life balance, again, a score of 50% does indicate a huge room for improvement. Over the 10 indicators globally, the world stands at 72%, which is 70% good, but then, no, let's keep it glass half, 30% still needs to be done. We then move on to the major big key takeaways that we have. We have seen a lot of reforms across the globe. So if you look on the left-hand side, we have access to same job that has, five, that has seen five reforms across the world. Paternity leave, as mentioned earlier, the prohibition to ask for pregnancy during in, you know, inquiry and recruitment and equal paperwork of equal value. So we are definitely going in the right direction. We've had 17 countries that had their rankings improve and sadly 77 countries that had their rankings worse and either through new legislations or score adjustments. We saw Burundi having a huge uh, increase in score with the 11.5 increase, whereas Guatemala did drop by negative 4.5. What we'll do is we'll quickly go over the conceptual framework of the LRI as we're aware that not a, not a lot of people might be 100% on board with how the scoring is done. We'll use an example country and a question just to really clarify it, just to make sure that there aren't any doubts left. The LRI, as mentioned earlier, is based on the 10 decent work indicators that go from fair wages to decent working hours, employment security. We have two indicators that deal with uh, work-life balance that would be family responsibility and maternity and work. We also look at safe work, social security. Uh, we have fair treatment and the last two indicators would be child and forced labor and trade union. Each indicator has four to five questions and all of those countries are then uh, graded or marked on those four to five questions each. When it comes to the data source, the first point will always be that country's legislation. We will look through it, we will look to any decrees, amendment, CBA, or any or the decent work check itself to find a concrete legal basis on which we can either give this country a one or a zero. And again, as the second point said, we have a simple dichotomous scoring system for all 46 indicators. And yeah, you basically get a one if you do well and a zero if you don't do well, which we will clarify in a couple of minutes. The labor rights index doesn't assign weight, which means that each of the 10 indicators feed in equally into the final score of the, of the country. Finally, we value rating versus ranking. So instead of ranking countries, we provide them with rating. We divide, um, divide them into six brackets that allow country to see where they currently are and how much work that needs to be done. What we'll do is we will look at Kenya, right? And we will look at how did it do on the fair treatment indicator, which is our eighth indicator. We'll look at just one question, which is, does the law require equal remuneration for work of equal value? The first thing with each question, all of the 46 indicators is setting a solid scoring criteria. Each criteria is heavily uh, grounded in international regulatory standard that are all ILO conventions. And for this specific one, we are using convention 100. The methodology as mentioned on the page is quite straightforward. It's a legislation mandates equal remuneration for male and female workers. Kenya gets one, otherwise zero. Then we look for a legal base, uh, look at the legislation and constitution, and we are able to grade each of the five criteria within the fair treatment based on that. So this is literally, this is word for word what you would find on the country profile of Kenya. The five questions with their score and strong legal basis, so if anybody wants to confirm or use that as a starting point for the discussion, they will know where to go and look for it. The final thing is that we calculate the cumulative score. Each of the 10 indicators is then scaled up to 100. So Kenya did very well in the fair treatment indicator and was able to get all five questions right. So then scaled up, that would be 100. The overall score that Kenya has, when we average all 10 indicators, is 68. How do we interpret that 68? That 68 is then placed on our rating scale. With a score of 68, uh, Kenya would be placed on limited access to decent work. Right? The scale starts from 0 to 50, where that would be total lack of decent work. And with each increments of 10, we move up a bracket with the highest best score being decent work being available. So 68, limited access to decent work. So Kenya knows that with two more points, it can be bumped up to the next uh, rating band. The final thing is our finding. So the same process that we just talked about Kenya was done across all 46 indicators for 
each one third by country. And that is what allowed us to create this heat map. This heat map allows us to quickly, very visually see where, where is the world currently at? If you want to look at your own country, that's basically what I always look for what Pakistan is. And you can just look at the color and read it off the scale. And this allows us to understand where we are at this point and how much work needs to be done either globally, regionally, or even across income groups. The report that has been published online has a table of overall scores and ratings. So you have each country with its current score, its previous year scores, and any rating changes that it, have, that it had. So a positive score change or a negative score change have both been highlighted. Finally, we have country profiles that, as the video mentioned, are standalone documents that can then be used with any specific person, individual, or body to uh, understand where their country is going. So again, for Kenya, this is what their country profile's first page would look like. It has three big components. The first bar on the top, country's name, with its score, where is it located, and what income group is it from. The second uh, middle bit is the contextual indicators that we use that not only give you information about population, a lot of economic indicators, and even the size of informal employment in the country. So you can combine this with the score to get a better understanding of what the score would actually mean for that country. The final and third component is the performance on each indicators. So we see that Kenya did well, not only on the fair treatment indicator, but the child and forced labor. And if there is any room for improvement, that would be fair wages with the lowest score of 40. This is then average to give you 68, which is the final score that Kenya was, you know, got. On the second page of each country profile, you will have a detailed breakdown of all 46 questions, along with their scores and the legal basis that has been used. So this is the question, these are the legal basis, and all of them are available on their Labor Rights Index Heat Map 2020, which I'll just quickly uh, show you. So this is basically what the heat map looks like. You can click on a specific country. We have Kenya open here. You can click on looking at the country profile and all of this is available. So if you want to go ahead and look for your own country, just the Labor Rights Index and the heat map page will you know, provide the rest of the information. What are our next steps? What do we plan to accomplish by LRI 2020? The first thing is we always would like to increase the expansion or the scope of the index. We do hope to include 10 more countries and take the index to 145 countries. We additionally want to increase the aspects of decent work that we're assessing countries on. So we hope to include the inclusion of daycare and child care centers at the workplace. We would like to assess the fair treatment of part-time workers. We would look at, we would like to look at the prohibition of worst forms of child labor. And the final thing is, because this is a changing world, we would like to assess countries on their, on their remote work legislation, how or where do they stand with that? The third step is we would like to further refine the scoring. So take it from a binary scoring to a ternary methodology. But would that imply that instead of giving countries um, a simple zero to one, we might actually look into giving them a 0.5 if they're halfway there, but not quite there. And that is basically all there is from the CLR organization. If you have any questions, any comments, any feedback, you are more than welcome to just kind of reach out to us on the laborrightsindex.org. And I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tika and Nina. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. And I uh, cannot believe you did all of that in 15 minutes. Thank you so much for all your work and the, and the presentation as well. Um, Iftika, there's one question for you that I think would be relevant to answer now before we move to the panel, uh, which is from Dominique Muller, um, and she asks how the uh, Labor Rights Index links to the ITC Global Rights Index that draws evidence and experience from unions in, and workers globally. Can you reply to that, Iftika? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, what differentiates us from the ITUC's Labor Rights Index is uh, the uh, the one from the IDUC is very complex, and uh, it it has uh, it has huge data behind it. We are looking at a limited number of indicators for trade union, and uh, but we don't use this scoring in our work. Uh, we look at the labor legislation again ourselves, uh, but at the same time we also look at the comments of the CSCR Committee of Experts, uh, and also we also use the reports by. U.S. laws, uh, country reports on human rights practices. Uh, but yes, our, our work is a bit different than uh, they have. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I see one more question coming in, and that's the final, and then we go to uh, to the uh, to the panel. Um, and that's from Bernard. He asks, uh, to what extent have you taken into account different laws for different groups or different sectors? So we look at the labor legislation that is applicable generally to the workers. Uh, as we have, um, a, a, as a short video also explained, we look at uh, the legislation that is applicable to a worker who is employed in an enterprise which has at least 60 workers. So our we are not looking at the legislation for domestic workers. Thanks a lot. Um, round of applause for the team. And um, thank you for the explanation. I think it sets the stage uh, perfectly for the web or for the uh, panel discussion that we will now have. Um, I welcome Pauline Ossa, who I think all of you know uh, as the former director of the Wage Indicator.